Good day and welcome to JCC Sunday Schools in Session, where Sunday School matters to God. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. We would love to have you to be a part of the JCC family. Our Sunday School lesson is titled, Accept God's Invitation, and it's coming from Luke, the 14th chapter, verses 7 through 11, and 15 through 25. My suggested title for this today is Make the Preparation while saving the date. It is very important that we make the necessary preparation to accept the invitation that God offers. But we also know that we have to save the date. If we cannot get to a place where we get so loose, so tied up into the things of this world, that we begin to make excuses and not attend the wedding feast. Our lesson is a parable that illustrates the invitation to the wedding feast. This symbolizes the work done now before Christ's return. God has selected a chosen group who rejected the invitation, so God extends the invitations to others. Are we ones who have rejected God, or are we ones who accepted his invitation? There will come a day where God will show us those whom he has accepted and those whom he has rejected. Let's begin reading verse 7. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out of the chief rooms, saying unto them. Let's pause right there for a second. Question one says, what did Jesus observe as he watched the people coming in? Jesus had already observed that the people at the banquet had been acting to look after their own interests. They scrambled for the places of honor at the banquet table. They were looking out for themselves. They wanted to be in the high places, in the seats of honor. Because in those days, the seating arrangements at a dinner showed a definite order of prestige or honor. The most honored person sat in a particular seat, and next, the next most honored person sat next to them, and so on and so on down the line. Luke writes about this here when he talks about the scribe and the Pharisees who did this in Luke chapter 20, verses 46 and 47. Listen to what it says. It says, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greeting in the marketplace and the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make a long prayer, they will receive the greater condemnation. Verse 7, we see the same thing happening in which Jesus, the people look to exalt themselves, just like they did in Luke chapter 20. And Luke chapter 20 says, this is going to bring condemnation. This is to teach us that as he used this parable to get his point across about how we go in and operate in the kingdom of God. Do we have a high mindedness about us thinking that we deserve the best or do we come in with an aspect of humility knowing that, hey, if it had not been for the Lord on our side, we would have never gotten in. Let's look at verses eight and nine. It says, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not in the highest room, lest a more honorable man thou, than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. So question two says, how did Jesus say they should act when attending such an event? Jesus said that when a person was invited to a wedding, he should not assume that he would get the best seat because the host may have invited someone more deserving of that place of honor. So Christ is showing a person should never assume anything or have an expectation to get preferred treatment. Christ says in verse 9 that when we look to get exalted, it may cause us to get shame. What is Christ trying to show to us there? is that we should have a spirit of humility to not look to come in and get the best of the best. No, we come in knowing that long as I made it in, we say in the church as a greeter, as long as I was keeping the doors inside the church, it didn't matter nowhere where else I was. And that's the attitude that we need to have. And that's the attitude that we should have. Notice the difference in verse 10. It says, but when thou art bidden, Go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at the meat with thee. 
we see here that God honors those who, who do not seek honor from other people. It shows us here in these verses that Jesus gives the guest in the Pharisee's home a lesson in humility. He tells them it's better to first sit in the lowest places and then be invited by the host to sit at the highest table, the place of honor. He says, then when you do that, you'll be honored in the presence of other guests. Whereas if you do it the opposite way and he has someone else to sit in that seat, you will be dealing with humiliation. If a person chooses to sit in the highest seat, to think that they deserve it, that they want to self-exalt themselves, they want to be looked upon amongst other people as big and high and mighty. He says, what happens when you have to move? When you have to be moved to a lower place, that brings about humiliation. It takes a person who has his nose in the air and then has to place it to the ground. He's showing us that it's better to be humbled in the very beginning and then allow the guest of honor to exalt you, to pull you up, to bring you to a place of higher. So question three says, what principle regarding being exalted is Jesus trying to teach us here? Jesus then is verbalizing a very important life principle that's found in verse 11. It says, For whosoever exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. It happens because of God's control. The attitude of the world is to promote oneself and achieve recognition in order to be successful. Christ's desires is that we humble ourselves and let him do the exalting if and whenever he sees fit. Self-exaltation will ultimately result in humiliation. But when we allow ourselves to be humble, it's then that God can take the humble and place them in a place of honor. Question four is what lesson about self-exaltation can we learn from this? In spiritual terms, it's not the one who exalts himself who is truly honored, but rather the one whom God exalts. In these verses, the guests jockeyed for position at a table. They were self-exalting themselves. While they believed that getting ahead required them to seek and push everybody else down in order to get them to a place of status, Jesus told them that the way to get ahead was to take the place of less honor and status. We learned that status is gained by giving it up. One is exalted by humbling himself, Jesus said. As children of God, it is far better to humbly carry out whatever ministry God has called us to without seeking public acclaim. When we endeavor to exalt ourselves, we usually look foolish. But when God honors us in some way, we become a testimony to others of how he can use us effectively. The kingdom of God is offered to all kinds of people, to the rich, to the economically, spiritually poor. But God wants us, no matter what our status is, to still remain humble, to have that humble spirit in order to receive the salvation that God has for us. Question five reads, what statement did one of the guests make to Jesus after this? Verse 15 says, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. That this man spoke a blessing of his own. Maybe he, being a Pharisee or someone like a Pharisee, thought that only those who were like them who followed the law will be invited to the great end time feast to eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. Question six, what was the person's understanding concerning the kingdom of heaven? This particular guest did not really understand what Jesus had been teaching here. He makes a statement, but it's like he's trying to impress Jesus about his status. And many times we make that same accusation. We try to impress people about what we've done or what we've accomplished of how we did this and that. No, this is not the meaning here. This man was trying to connect his mind to the idea of being honored and blessed. It's because of those who are prosperous people who attended this here banquet. It's almost like you had to be of a certain social status in order to reap the rewards and benefits in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is going to show us something here. See, Jesus showed him in verse 14, which is not part of our lesson, he mentioned that the resurrection of the just and this man's mind must have thought because he kept the law, he was just. That he was worthy of being in the kingdom to eat the bread. 
This is wrong thinking to think of oneself more highly than they should. He may have thought in status or position elevated them to the best seats in the kingdom of God. But God's word spoke of those who are lowly, humble, and hungry for righteousness. He says in Matthew 6, as the Sermon on the Mount, those are the ones that are blessed. Those who don't look at themselves more than they should are the ones that are really blessed in the kingdom of God. Question 7 says, how did Jesus portray salvation in his parable? Let's read verse 16 and 17. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. This is going back to answer the man's question who came in and, and made the assumption that uh, he would be in the kingdom eating uh, the bread because of his social status, because he had kept the law. He was a Pharisee and he kept the law. Notice the answer here. Jesus gave the idea of a great supper to portray salvation. He's trying to show them that in order to become part of God's kingdom, one must first be receive the invitation and accept the invitation and receive the salvation that comes from it. The invitation to the supper represents the invitation of God has given to people to become part of his family through his son, Jesus Christ. Here, Christ is about to show unless we have accepted him, that invitation, the acceptance of God's invitation has not been kept. See, please see this before we go any further. Everyone had a prior invitation and accepted the invitation initially. This is important for us to note here as we get further in the lesson, especially in verse 18. But before we get there, I want to make a point. God has chosen to use us as his, his ambassadors to invite the lost to salvation. Throughout the Old Testament, it makes announcements that the Messiah was coming. And we know back then that all of Israel was ready for his arrival. The announcement was received, and they gladly accepted his arrival. But no one knew the exact time of his arrival. But it was certainly good news that he was coming. For he would provide deliverance for his people. The people of Israel were expecting, and they were ready. At least they thought they were. We are to be ready today as well, for we know not the day nor the hour the Son of Man shall return. Will we have oil for our candles or be unprepared like those who did not? We must be prepared to accept the invitation if we have not already accepted it. If we have accepted it, we're the servants going out delivering the message for God to let others get the acceptance as well. Let's read question eight. What happened to the master in Jesus' parable? after he invited a large group of guests to dinner. Let's read verses 18 through 20. And they all with one consent began to make excuses. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have excused me. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I have to go prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Remember again, as I told you, the invitation had already went out. It was customary that the invitation goes out early so people can make preparations to be there. So the invitation of Jesus Christ is going out each and every day. It's up to us to make the necessary preparations to come and be a part of it. But we see here in these verses, when the time came for them to come, they made excuses. Every one of them had an excuse and begged to be excused from the feast. We see here that everyone had that excuse, and that ex excuse was not up to par. So, so we see all of these excuses were just excuses. The point I want to make here is that we should not be surprised if the gospel is not met with excuses rather than joyous acceptance. These verses are to reflect, again, a Pharisee or someone who is self-righteous. As soon as they are called to honor their commitment, or as soon as they realize the cost of discipleship is higher than what they are willing to pay to give, they come back with an excuse. Self-righteous people routinely use excuses even still to this day. They make excuses to come to church, to, to come to God, 
to, to, to do the work that God has called us to do. If even as we look at those who are supposed to be righteous, making so many excuses, why do we not think that those who are unrighteous, this is to show that many who are even going to church and not really connected to the church, when it comes time to do the will of God, many will find an excuse for why they cannot go. When the Messiah finally arrives in Israel, a large number of people, like I say, were so involved with their everyday lives that they were not interested in hearing what he had to say. They paid little or no attention to the message he proclaimed. They were simply too busy to get involved in the normal activities to make changes at that time in their life. This still holds true today. We must be careful of preoccupation. This is the trick of the enemy to get people preoccupied with the affairs of life, thus make excuses when it comes to the time to work for the Lord. We must work while it's day, because night cometh and no man can work. So God doesn't want us to use excuses. He does not want us to get so preoccupied with the affairs of this world that we lose sight of what God has for us. Question 9 says, what step did he then take to fill his banquet hall with people? Let's read verses 21 to 22. So that the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in thither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Let's pause there for a second. The servants are obedient to what the master has asked them to do. The master is the representation of God. So as they returned from those who made excuses, they went out and did exactly what God said do. God says, go out quickly. Go out to the streets. Go out to the lanes in the city. Go out thither and bring those who are less forced, those who are looked down upon, the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. See, as those who make excuses, God takes then the opportunity to open the door to somebody else. See, the, the excuses angered God. And thus God then invites other people. This is to show those whom should have come refuse, so others are invited to the place. This is how the grafting of Gentiles are grafted into the family. The, din the dinner was ready and the time was now of essence. So God says, go get those, those who are looked down upon, those who are less fortunate, those who think people shouldn't be, uh, be around, be near. Invite them. And we see they came. And yet it was still room. See, the point is, despised and forgotten of the world are the objects of God's love. God is willing to invite all those who are willing, and I say again, willing to come to the wedding feast. Notice what he says in verse 23 and 24. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which are bidden shall taste of my supper. Question 10 says, how are so many people today like the Israelites of Jesus' day and their response to him? Let me try to explain these here verses for a second. Christ comes back in because there's still room. He says, go out to the hedges and the highways. And again, this is the grafting of those who are not necessarily uh, of the uh, Israelite descent. God says there's still room. Go out to the world and invite everyone in the world to come. Notice it says, invite them to come. He says, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. He says, for I say unto you that none of these men that were bidden shall taste of my supper. He's saying here that those who are self-righteous, those who are willing to uh, make excuses, those who are willing to really not uh, be humble and and, and do the will of God instead of being full of pride and thinking about themselves and about status and following uh, materialistic things. He says those will not be able to come into the supper. What does he mean there? Those will not be the ones be, will be able to come into the kingdom of God. God is saying we have to take a position of lowliness, a position of servitude, are we willing to be in a position of humility, of humbleness, of serving God, of doing the work and the will of God to compel men and women to come 
to Jesus Christ. This is the, the, the meat of this lesson. The point is we should make every effort to take the gospel to unbelievers, to take it to those in our families who have not truly accepted the Lord for, as their Savior. And maybe for some of those who've accepted him, but their attitudes are too high-minded, they're too self-righteous, we should take the gospel to them to help them to see that ultimately how to respond properly to the word of God, respond to it in humility, to understand that we must be ready to accept the invitation now while we have breath in our bodies. Our lesson this week shows us how we as Christians, as we experience the good news of, of Jesus, are to go out and invite others to the kingdom of God. We want everyone to taste of this feast that has been prepared for them by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are to do this in a loving manner as we meet them, not to break them down, not to destroy them, but to lift them up. We should reach out that hand to lift them up. Well, that concludes our lesson this week. I hope that you've enjoyed it. If so, please leave us a, a, some feedback. Leave us a comment. and Also give us a thumbs up. And if you have not subscribed, Subscribe to our channel. We would love to have you be a part of the JCC family. Well, again, that's all for this week. Come back next week. Same time, same channel. Be blessed now.